uh, we can start. Uh, thank you everybody for joining the webinar uh, Elemental uh, 2020. Uh, today the speaker is uh, Adam Cheminet. Uh, he's uh, going to talk about uh, O'Leary versus uh, Lagrangian reversibility in uh, an experimental equivalent for Kahneman Cam uh, flow. Um, he's uh, um, currently uh, he currently changed his uh, affiliation. He's uh, a research engineer at uh, SPCCEA. Uh, uh, and uh, let me briefly introduce him and then uh, I'll leave him the stage. Uh, so Adam Chevigny did his uh, PhD thesis at uh, ONERA uh, on the development of 3D tomographic PAV and defended it in 2016. Uh, he was then a temporary teaching and research assistant uh, in the Department of uh, Mechanics at uh, Pierre et Marie Curie University for two years. In 2018, he joined the LMFL uh, as a postdoctoral fellow, where he worked on uh, metrological development of the measurement of dense velocity field by Lagrange and Hacke. Thereafter, he joined the exploit team at uh, SPCCA, uh, which is working on experimental exploration of dissipation structures and turbulence. He then became a contractual teacher engineer uh, at the RMIT campus in uh, 2020, and he is now a research engineer uh, at SPCCA. Uh, where he's in charge of the vortex imaging uh, platform, consisting of innovative uh, test bands uh, that allow uh, measurements at very high resolution below the dissipative scale of the turbulent tur of the developed turbulence. So uh, thank you, Adam, for uh, presenting uh, today for uh, the seminar you're going to give. Uh, I now stop sharing my screen and uh, leave you uh, the stage. I start start sharing yours if you want. All right. Thanks again. Thanks a lot, Francesco. I will start sharing my screen. Do you see it? Is everything fine? Yes. All right, awesome. Well, uh, hi everyone. Uh, thanks again, uh, Francesco, for the kind uh, introduction. Uh, thanks a lot for giving me the uh, opportunity to speak to the, this webinar at LMFL and uh, to share with you some, uh, some ideas. Uh, it's always a pleasure to, uh, to do so at, uh, in Lille. And I wish that in uh, a not too distant future, we'll be able to uh, gather uh, and to see, and I'll be able to see you in person, which is way better than in cyberspace. Real space is always better. So I will speak about uh, the work that I did as a postdoc in two different labs, uh, LMFL and SPECSERA. And I will try to uh, sum it up as best as possible and to give you the main, main results and not to uh, lose you too much. So we'll speak about uh, experimental study of Eulerian and Lagrangian reversibility in a von Kármán flow. Uh, I will start with some general uh, remarks. Um, oh, by the way, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to, to answer to, to just ask. Um, don't, don't wait for the, till the, the end of the talk. So uh, some general remarks about reversibility in, in physics. So, I found a uh, qualitative, uh, qualitative definition for reversibility in physics, and it says that a reversible process is a process in which the system and environment can be restored to exactly the same initial states as they were in before a process occurred, if we go back along the path of the process. So the question is, what do we have in, in a turbulent flow? Is turbulence reversible? So if one considers a turbulent flow in a state x at time let's say equal to zero and you let it evolve uh, you let the system evolve in turbulence you will end you will end up at time t at a uh, state x of t now let us suppose that we are able to turn uh, the velocity uh, turn into u into minus u and also turn the time uh, into minus time and try to go back in time and let the system evolve in turbulence. Do, you, do we go back to the same initial points? Your physical insight and intuition will tell you no, and you'd be right. Uh, for maybe for a small time at the beginning, the path will may be the same, but at some point, the path backward uh, will di diverge from the path forward, and you will end up uh, at two different states and in a different state than before. And this is very well, very well summed up in a statement from uh, 
Milton Van Dyke, who says that turbulence mixes stuff up. It does not unmix it. And so why is it so? Well, if you consider the Navier-Stokes equations and you consider a uh, time reversal symmetry that turns u into, into minus u and the time into minus time, you quickly realize that uh, the Navier-Stokes are invariant in this symmetry only for viscosity equal to zero. Uh, that means that time uh, reversal symmetry is broken by viscosity ex uh, explicitly, I mean, in the equations. Uh, what is interesting, and as you all know, is that in the limit of viscosity tends to zero, because of what we know as uh, dissipation anomaly, uh, um, the, we all know that dissipation rates in turbulence tends to a constant when the viscosity tends to zero. That dissipation becomes independent from viscosity, which means that uh, turbulence is still irre irreversible when uh, viscosity tends to zero. And then time reversal symmetry is broken, spontaneously broken, in the limit of uh, um, viscosity tends to zero. So the question is why? Well, one possible answer was, can be found in what is known as Unzeger uh, conjecture. So it states that um, uh, basically, he says that in three, dimension, um, in three dimensions, a mechanism for complete dissipation of all kinetic energy even without the aid of viscosity is still available. So it states that um, the non-regularity of the velocity field can create an inertial dissipation. So there's viscous dissipation and also inertial dissipation. And those non-regularities, um, which you can see them as mathematical discontinuities, are what people called singularities. So do we have such events in, in, uh, in turbulence? And if so, how can we find them? Uh, in 2000, Duchamp and, and Robert uh, derived from the KHM equations an energy budget at a given scale L. So um, on the left, so you have uh, energy variation for scales which are larger than L. Here you have a spatial transport and diffusion. And on the uh, right hand side of the equations, you have two important terms. Uh, on the right here, you have viscous dissipation due to scales which are larger than L. Uh, so this is pure, so this is viscous dissipation. And here you have what is called uh, Duchamp-Robert term, di, which you can see as interscale transfer towards scales which are smaller than L. So if there is a singularity, there will be uh, a huge amount of energy. We will go from large scale to infinitely small scales and if there is a singularity this term here which is a scalar will not be zero so it's interesting to look at those uh, terms and to see whether or not you, you have such uh, such events so and the, so the sum of those two terms di and d nu here represent the overall uh, local dissipation at scale l and it, it represents, in source, the local irre irreversibility in the flow, at least in the Eulerian framework. So now I've just talked about you about the Eulerian framework. What, so what do we have in the Lagrangian framework? It's, so it's always interesting to look at Lagrangian framework because and try to understand in this framework, uh, which we most don't have. Uh, I mean, most things uh, is done on a, on a Eulerian framework. And it's interesting to try to translate Eulerian from to uh, Lagrangian framework. So irreversibility in uh, Lagrangian framework is best seen when looking at not one, but actually two particles. Uh, oops, I have a small bug here. All right, um, at two particles initially separated by an, inst uh, an initial distance r and which separate uh, in turbulence. This is a very old, I'd say not very old, but quite old uh, question and a fundamental one. And um, we have several um, uh, knowledge about those things. So at long times, we, there is what is called the Richardson law that says that in average, the mean squared separation uh, is, sorry, um, is as, goes as the time to a power of power three. 
is independent of the initial separation and also that backwards dispersion is stronger than forward uh, di um, dispersion. Those two, two coefficients are not the same if you go back in time or you go a long time. Although it's, it's, it's been checked numerically in numerical simulation, it's very hard to do it experimentally. And for instance, we are still not quite sure about the value of those coefficients. So this is for long times. For short times, uh, Yusha and Al in 2014 showed that uh, basically the, the gap between backward and forward dispersion is still present at, sh at short time and it was a signature of Lagrangian ir irreversibility. We still have, so backward dispersion stronger than, stronger than uh, forward, but, uh, for, but uh, we, for instance, do not know how is, is it related to the long times. We don't know how the uh, this uh, coefficient, which is four times the uh, dissipative, the um, uh, dissipation rates, uh, local dissipation rates, is, is it related to those coefficients at, at long times? And in the limit of Reynolds tends to infinity, there is something that we know as spontaneous stochasticity. Basically, it means that uh, when viscosity tends to zero, um, the deterministic nature of the particle trajectory is supposed to disappear. Basically, we have to, are supposed to have stochastic trajectories. So if you take two particles, uh, whatever their, their uh, initial distance, they will independently uh, um, separate from uh, the initial separation uh, distance. And some mathematician uh, think that there may be a link with singularities in turbulence, which would break the unis unicity of the solution and, and thus uh, separate the, the particles. So if I have to sum up what I've just said, which is uh, quite a, a lot because uh, huge ideas, uh, we have basically two frameworks. So we have the Eulerian framework where we, where we have the uh, energy budget and the two inertial uh, the two dissipation, so inertial dissipation and viscous dissipation terms. And then we have the Lagrangian framework with, with Richardson law at long, long times. And, and then at short times, we have a Lagrangian irreversibility indicator, a, a, a mean one, basically. And so what is interesting is that in 2019, uh, Davas, uh, we took this um, mean irreversibility indicator and we wrote it uh, to make it local basically and so as to have uh, uh, an indicator that is um, a, a function of space and time. Um, so he um, basically he changed the average into a local filter to get uh, a local irreversibility criteria and then he showed was interesting that he showed mathematically that under certain conditions where we are supposed to have a viscosity that tends to zero, the resolution uh, also tends to zero, the scale, the different scales at, at which we are looking things also tends to zero, and also the time scale. So L is the spaced uh, scale, and uh, uh, tau, tau is the time scale. It's also supposed to go to zero. So he showed that those two indicators, Eulerian and Lagrangian, are supposed to be equal and are supposed to be equal to the local dissipation at this point and at this time. So the question is now, can we check, can we experimentally check this uh, theorem? So if I had to sum, to sum up my uh, talk in a nutshell, I would say that it's a story of what an experimentalist has to suffer through in order to experimentally check a math theorem. Uh, so I will try to make it a, a, as for, um, I will, try, I will make it easy, as easy as possible for you not to suffer as I did. Uh, but I will have two, uh, two questions. So it will be a variable two parts. The first one is how can we comp compute those indicators? What kind of efforts do we have to do as an experimentalist to be able to compute those indicators? And the second question is how far can we go regarding the theorem's hypothesis, all those limits that had to go either to zero or infinity or whatever, how far can we go? Because we know that uh, basically we will have a finite resolution and does this statement still holds more or less at a given finite resolution? Basically, are our, our measurements good enough? And did we probe uh, the turbulence? Can we probe the turbulence 
far enough. So first of all, what do we need? Well, we need a, a flow, uh, basically. Um, so a, a setup. So uh, what we are using at CRI is uh, the Van Kalman flow, which is well known by the uh, its nickname, the French washing machine. Um, so it's two counter rotating impellers uh, at both ends of the cylinder that generate turbulence uh, by giving um, the fluid, which is water, uh, a shear. So they rotate at a frequency F. And for here, uh, we use a relatively small uh, von Karman and the radius is, uh, is, is 10 centimeter. So the Reynolds number is a function of, uh, so the frequency, uh, the radius, and also, and also the viscosity, of course. Uh, we can have uh, an average, um, an estimation of the dissipation rates through the torque. And what is interesting is that the Mogol of length scale, uh, so here is, you can rewrite it as a function of several things, Reynolds number, uh, a normalized uh, dissipation rates, and also the radius, which means that if we want to be able to zoom into the turbulence, one thing we can do is increase the radius, which we did, and uh, we build a huge Van Karman, a giant Van Karman, and we will be, we hope that uh, it will uh, allow us to uh, zoom very far into turbulence, uh, maybe see or not uh, singularities uh, in turbulence. So, uh, but the, the, all the results that I will be showing will be on the, the smaller one, but uh, we are expecting to have uh, results soon on the bigger one. So now what do we need also? So we need velocity. We need Lagrangian, the, the, uh, the Lagrangian, the Lagrangian velocity field as well as the Eulerian one. So thanks to 4D uh, particle tracking velocimetry, we are able to have dense Lagrangian fields, which is about, for, for instance, I show here is about 40,000 particles in a 50 by 40 by six millimeter volume. And the volume is quite right at the center of uh, von Kármán. And here is a small movie where you see the flow, you see particles evolving, you see vortexes, uh, you see all kinds of structures. And it's quite uh, mesmerizing. I hope you all see the, um, the, the movie quite well. And it's not too, um, uh, it's good. Um, so yeah, I always love to see this uh, picture. Uh, so, um, uh, oh. So now, what are the obstacles uh, left that we have to uh, overcome? So because we, we, we end up with the Lagrangian field, and, uh, which is a set of trajectories. The thing is, uh, those trajectories are noisy trajectories, and sometimes there are wrong tracks, or what we call ghost tracks. And the thing is, uh, well, we depend on Lagrangian tracks to obtain the Eulerian uh, flow field. The um, relation between Lagrangian flow field and Eulerian is this one. So you have the partial derivative of a particle position, which is equal to the Eulerian velocity at the position of uh, the particle. And so to obtain, it, uh, to obtain the Eulerian uh, field from the uh, Lagrangian uh, field, one needs to interpolate into, let's say, a regular grid. And so you have uh, different questions because the thing is any temporal noise on the particle trajectory will impact the, everything, the Lagrangian uh, flow field, of course, and the Eulerian velocity field. So one kind, so we have two kinds of interrogations. We have uh, interrogations for Lagrangian flow field and also Eulerian. For Lagrangian, uh, how does the measurement noise impact the Lagrangian statistics? and afterwards uh, the Eulerian flow field. And basically, how can we get rid of the temporal noise as much as possible? For the Eulerian flow field, um, well, we have to, uh, to do some kind of also some smoothing, some spatial smoothing, because we still have uh, spatial noise that arise from uh, ghost tracks. And the question now is, um, what kind of uh, sp uh, spatial resolution is accessible? How far can we go into the small scales? And um, how can we increase, is it possible through the interpolation to increase uh, the spatial resolution? So those are two huge uh, questions and I will only focus in my presentation on the first one. And basically the question is, how can we get rid of temporal noise in the particle uh, 
in the uh, Lagrangian um, flow field. So we need to get rid of the noise uh, as much as possible. And if simply put, if um, the idea is that our signal is a multi-frequency signal with, and the thing is, uh, we think that the high frequency, the, sorry, the noise is a high frequency noise. So the idea is basically um, what everybody, everybody, everybody has been doing is to use a low pass filter, which will remove unwanted uh, high frequencies. And the question is now, uh, which cutoff frequency should we choose? Which time scale should we choose to remove um, the noise? So uh, traditionally, the filter length scale is chosen in a range of length scales uh, uh, on which the acceleration statistics, which are most sensitive to, uh, uh, to noise, are left unchanged. And it's been done by Mordant et al. in 2004 up to uh, uh, newer studies in 2017. But the thing is, is that they all agree that uh, this choice is quite arbitrary because sometimes we don't have ranges uh, where uh, the acceleration statistics are left unchanged. It really depends on the type of flows, on the, of the, kind of, on the type of measurements you have, on, on a lot of things. And so the question is, uh, can we have a more precise criteria, a more rigorous one, almost automatic? automatic uh, um, and also, so this is the first question. And so the second part of my talk is, at the end of the day, does it allow us to check Druva's uh, theorem on the equivalence of Lagrangian and um, allowing um, um, irreversibility? So uh, I will talk about a, a, an algorithm which is called TrackFit for um, temporal denoising for 4D PTV. And the idea is to model the trajectory on a V-spine curve. So at each time instant, you put a basis function, which is a polynomial, and all those uh, uh, basis functions are controlled by coefficients. And the question is, what are, how can we access to those coefficients? So in 1949, uh, Ellers and Marx introduced a uh, regularized V-spine. So this is uh, what we are doing, where the C coefficients are, find, are found by minimizing uh, a given functional. And this functional is the sum of a classic uh, least square functional. Um, so the error on, on the left here, the error on the noisy data and a regularization parameter, which is chosen as the k derivative of a V-spine curve. And um, Gezeman uh, et al. in 2016, instead of choosing, cho sorry, chose k equal to three uh, to regularize of the trajectory. So it's the derivative of the acceleration. And so the lambda parameter, which is here in, in front, um, is the, basically is the power of the, the regularization. If lambda equal to zero, you don't have any regularization. You will not smooth at all your, your signal. So you will have a lot of noise. And if lambda equal to infinity, the regularization will dominate all the functional and your algorithm will smooth everything almost too much. So therefore, is there a best tuning parameter available? Uh, how can we find it? And uh, what is the, f um, the filter response, uh, basically? So uh, first question that we can ask ourselves is, uh, since we have a, a low pass filter, it's designed as such, what is its uh, spectral behavior? Well, um, uh, and also, the second question is, what is the link between the cutoff frequency, which uh, we want to tune, and the, the, the lambda, the um, parameter? Uh, well, the, the first thing that you can do is that you can uh, uh, um, compute the filter transfer function, and I did so, and also uh, show it uh, analytically. Um, and so you clearly see uh, a low-pass filter with a minus six slope, and a relationship between the cutoff frequency and the lambda parameter. The bigger the lambda, the smaller the cutoff frequency is, basically. And now the question is, so which cutoff frequency should we choose? The idea is simple. So the noise is high frequency. So if you have, let's say, a signal here in blue, um, your noisy signal, so the, in blue is the un unnoisy signal. The noisy signal will be in, in red. And 
um, the hypothesis is here that it's, uh, uh, it's, it's a, the, the spectrum is flat. Uh, so, you had, so you have white noise. And so, uh, well, um, the signal uh, you see has a negative slope. So one can define the frequency at which uh, the signal and the noise cross. And this frequency is called, is where the signal has the same amount of power as the noise. And so this is the frequency at which we say the signal to noise ratio is equal to one. So this frequency is supposedly is the best one to choose because uh, above this, uh, it's drowned in the noise and we want to keep as much as possible and remove the noise which is on the right side. So now in the real world, how can we find this frequency at which uh, the signal to noise ratio is equal to one? So there are several possibilities. The first one is based on a visual criteria, uh, on visual criteria. Uh, Gezeman et al. Uh, said that, well, you can choose, uh, you can uh, find um, basically the best cutoff frequency uh, by um, doing a, an intersection between an estimate signal uh, spectrum and an estimation of the noise spectrum. So, he, so here is your estimated noise spectrum, uh, which is flat and your, uh, your signal, you say, okay, I think this is right here. And so you do an intersection and you arrive here, which is not quite where the real um, um, SNR equal one frequency is, as we see. So it's one um, first idea. Another idea could, could be to say, okay, I will try to find the maximum uh, spectrum curvature. But the thing is here, represented in yellow, it's even further away. So. Can we do better? Uh, well, if you look uh, closely, uh, the problem that we have resembles a lot like what is called as Tikhonov regularization for ill post problem. Uh, so it's a least square problem where um, it's, uh, you, you minimize the, the functional with on the left here, um, um, the error on the data. And here you have uh, L2 norm, which is supposed to regularize your, your, your solution. And so the choice of the regularization parameter, he, uh, beta, uh, is always uh, sometimes found in what is called the L curve. So what is the L curve? So if you plot on the X axis uh, the regularization norm and on the Y axis the norm of the error of the data, and you do it for several uh, regularization parameter, you will end up in a, a curve which is like an L and the optimal uh, regularization parameter is always almost found, uh, is often found uh, at the corner of this L. So, um, um, so this is what we, you, one can do. Uh, you can compute on um, uh, such an L curve. So this is done um, on, uh, on DNS. I used uh, um, noise, I used DNS, sorry, Lagrangian, the, the Lagrangian, I have a, the, the um, uh, sorry, the, uh, the ground truth, and I put uh, Gaussian noise onto it, uh, and then I computed this for several lambdas, and I computed so the L curve, and I found the optimal, let's say, um, parameter by uh, computing the, um, uh, the maximum curvature, and so here is, so you have this uh, criteria, and now uh, we hope it's, it's the best one. Uh, can we do something else? Uh, yes, we can. Um, it's another, uh, another idea is to look at the spectral behavior of what is, uh, we can call the residual vector. Here are um, R lambda. Uh, the thing is, uh, if a filter does a perfect job, R lambda, which is the, um, um, the filtered version minus the real one, the noisy one. Um, but, well, the residual vector is nothing else than noise. If the, fi if, um, uh, the filter is perfect, uh, R lambda is supposed to be nothing but pure noise. This means that its uh, spectral behavior uh, is the same as the noise. So we may have an estimation, uh, for instance, uh, of the spectrum of the noise. We may, we may say, okay, we think that the noise is going to have a flat spectrum. Uh, it's Gaussian, it's flat. And uh, we may, um, uh, from the tail, basically, of, of the spectrum. So the idea is to choose a lambda 
which will give a residual vector which looks like noise as much as possible. And so to compare uh, uh, spectral behaviors of signals, we, uh, one can use what is called as normali uh, normalized cumulative uh, periodogram. It's uh, basically, it's the um, uh, spectrum, the sum of the uh, spectrum from zero to K, to the uh, uh, K wave number, over uh, normalized by uh, the sum all over all the wave numbers. So, uh, so let's say uh, you have some a signal, which is R here, which is white noise. If you compute its uh, uh, NCP, you will have basically uh, an NCP which goes from zero to one, which so shows how um, the, um, um, the, um, the, 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 the signal is, is spread uh, um, in, uh, in all wave numbers and it's evenly spread because it's white noise. And so it's supposed to be along the x equal y axis. So, uh, so this is for white noise. So if you take this white noise and you put a low pass filter, it means that um, a low pass filter um, uh, will keep only everything that is uh, on low frequency. So here in, in yellow, so uh, the NCP will mostly, uh, with a very fast, um, it will go uh, up to one very fast. And here you don't have anything because it has been removed. And on the opposite, if you have a high pass filter, so all the power is in the high frequencies, at the beginning you have uh, an NCP, NCP which is close to zero, and then it goes up to one. So the idea is to choose the regularization parameter, which NCP of R lambda, of the residual vector, is closest to different things. Um, first, we can say, okay, I think that my noise will be pure white noise. And so um, I have this criteria. You can go even, even further um, and, uh, and, we, and we want to say that uh, we, um, the NCP that we want to select is that of an estimated noise, noise which has been filtered by track fits. Um, so from the spectrum, we can estimate the noise and take into account the fact that uh, for low scales, uh, most low scales have been removed by the filter. And, uh, and so this will give us an NCP and we will um, take the, uh, the lambda which uh, corresponds to this NCP. So if uh, one computes NCPs, this is what you will end up. So for uh, white noise, uh, you will select this NCP in red. But for uh, an estimated noise, which has been filtered, you will end up having a different uh, choice. So now the question is, I've uh, uh, basically have added a lot of uh, different criteria, which are the best? Uh, so you can do a um, um, error statistical analysis on DNS tracks which, with added noise. And uh, the statistical error will allow us to understand which is the best. So I showed you a normalized uh, standard deviation error as a function of, of uh, lambda, the coefficient parameter. And you clearly see, uh, so for either the error on the position, x, the error on the velocity, vx, and the error on the acceleration, a of x, you clearly see here a, an optimum, which is uh, the frequency at which uh, the SNR is equal to one. In purple and yellow, here are the two visual criteria. In uh, green, this is the L-curve uh, criteria. And in blue and dark uh, um, red, those are the two uh, NCP criteria. And those which are closest are uh, the one in purple and the one uh, in uh, dark red, which is the NCP EN. And it's interesting also to uh, take a look at the acceleration error PDF because it allows us to visualize the way the error is spread and understand the kind of trade-off one has to do when filtering out the noise. So for instance, for a high lambda, uh, for instance, for, uh, which is, which, uh, for lambda NCP WN, so white noise here, it's relatively high, uh, the low accelerations we have, will have um, low errors uh, because uh, you smooth a lot. And so it means that your PDF will be peaked but for high accelerations, uh, it will smooth out too much. So there will be 
huge uh, um, errors in the tails. So the two which are the closest, uh, if you look cl closely, are lambda d and lambda, lambda ncpn and en. So those are uh, the two best. And you, you can go a, a bit further, but I think I will uh, run out of time because I uh, tend to speak too much. But basically, uh, uh, we saw, and especially if um, I will go a bit further, uh, if you do the, uh, um, if you apply those methods on experimental data, it's, it's interesting to have uh, an estimated noise, much more than uh, a, a visual criteria, because the main found findings that we had in, uh, in a real experimental uh, setup is that the noise here is not flat, it's not, uh, it's not white noise. And so it's very difficult to have a visual criteria. Uh, and the uh, lambda NCP uh, EN criteria gave much more, uh, a lot more uh, better results. So I think I only have, uh, how long is the um, uh, seminar uh, exactly? Is it uh, 45 minutes, 50? So it's about 50, 50 minutes, one hour, something like that. All right, All right, yeah, okay. I think I will uh, end up at like, uh, in maybe I will um, 45 minutes, which is, more than enough. But if you have any questions uh, about this, I can go further into details. So, uh, um, so basically, what I was uh, saying is that we have a quite good uh, idea of how to tune uh, the, the temporal um, denoising algorithm, which allows us to denoise the Lagrangian field and also have less noise in the Eulerian flow field. So this was the first part of my talk. And I will go into the second part, which is more physically based, which is at the end of the day, uh, are we able to, uh, to verify, to check experimentally uh, Drivers theorem? So uh, Drivers theorem uh, has, so there are two, the two uh, framework and we have um, conditions uh, for these theorems. Uh, for the Eulerian flow field, the condition is that we have to put viscosity to infinity, to zero, sorry, so Reynolds number to infinity, the, uh, the, uh, the length scale at which we probe uh, uh, the flow also has to tend to zero. The resolution of uh, our um, measurement has to go to zero. And also for the Lagrangian criteria, there are several uh, uh, limits that one has to do. So the, 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 the almost the same ones, there's also the, uh, the time at which we look things that has to go to zero for the Lagrangian framework. So the question is, are we capable, are we able to do those limits? So let's first uh, take a look at the Eulerian irre irreversibility, uh, ir irreversibility criterion. So with inertial dissipation and viscous dissipation. So uh, the theorem hypothesis, the first limit is that we have to put the viscosity to zero, which means basically we have to have uh, um, a, a very, uh, I mean, a Reynolds number which tends to uh, infinity. It's of course impossible to do in experimental. Uh, we, I mean, we can increase the Reynolds as much as possible, but at some point uh, we only do it at, at a given uh, Reynolds number. So if we do it at a given at a given Reynolds number, we ha we end up we end up uh, with a given um, um, energy spectrum. So uh, now, what is the other? Limit, uh, limit. Well, we have to put basically, and we, we have to try to have a resolution which goes to zero. So, what is what does that mean? Well, it's put the question on the the resolu the measurement resolution that we are able to do. The thing is, uh, we are limited by the mean interparticle distance in the Eulerian flow field. Everything which is above has been resolved because we have the data, and below this. Um, we don't have it because uh, it comes from the Lagrangian uh, trajectories. Uh, and um, so you can interpolate, but if you interpolate, it will not be physical. It will just be the interpolation. So this is uh, the further we can go. And so of course, uh, we have to probe uh, this, the, the uh, uh, Eulerian flow field with a given um, um, length scale. And this probe length scale uh, at which scale can we probe? Well, the, it's the same one. So basically, uh, the, the length scale at which we'll be able to, to probe those two, those two uh, uh, dissipation, inertial and viscous dissipation, will be 
two times the uh, mean interparticle distance. So we are limited by the maximum particles density, which is obtainable uh, in 4D PTV. Now on to the Lagrangian uh, criteria. So what do we have to do? The well, the first thing is uh, you take a particle at time uh, uh, somewhere in the flow, uh, and you look inside a ball of, of radius L, and you compute the Lagrangian dispersion uh, at, at this time t. You can do it uh, backward in time and forward in time. And you will end up with the evolution of backward and forward dispersion averaged into a ball of size L. And the uh, criteria is uh, the backward minus the forward divided by four tau to the power of three. So what kinds of limits do we have to do to check the uh, theorem? Well, the same one as before. Um, um, so uh, viscosity tends to zero, resolution is in uh, goes to zero, which we can't do in, in uh, either in Lagrangian or uh, uh, Larian flame framework. We also have to put the time that we observe to zero. So this we can do by a trick. So we fit the, uh, 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 the evolution uh, function basically uh, by uh, a coefficient time tau to the power three. And then um, the coefficient in front will give us uh, the limit of tau tends to infinity. So it will be A. And now the question is, uh, can we also put this ball to zero? Well, the thing is, we uh, at some point we can't because uh, if you uh, shrink too much this ball, you will only have let's say one uh, particle or no particles. So uh, and you need enough particles in this ball uh, to have converged statistics. So the the minimum distance uh, at which we can uh, look things will be higher than the uh, um, mean uh, interparticles distance. So. Uh, so now let us try to see uh, the two irre irreversibility indicators uh, given at a, a fixed revolution, uh, resolution. So I will show you two snapshots uh, at the same time instant for both indicators. So the first is for a DNS of homogene um, homogeneous isotropic turbulence. Um, so of course the Eulerian flow field is much more resolved than uh, the Lagrangian one. Uh, because I, we put uh, less particles than, uh, than, um, than mesh, basically, mesh size. Um, and, but still, we were able to probe uh, the Eulerian flow field up to the uh, Kolmogorov flame scale for the Eulerian framework, as opposed to uh, the Lagrangian field, where the ball is of size at, at 10 eta. So uh, it looks good. I mean, uh, uh, now the question is, do we have the same in the experimental uh, setup? And so here I show you what we have for our von Kamen flow at the Reynolds of about 6,000. And uh, the inter-distance, um, inter-particle distance is about 1.8 eta. Uh, so we can see several things. So first, there's a clear relation, let's say correlation between the two indicators. Uh, we have the same structures uh, at the same time. And, and most of the time we have the same values. Um, the only thing is that in the Lagrangian framework, uh, first it's more noisy than in the Eulerian, so it's due to the sparse nature of, of the data, but also the fact, especially for the uh, here the uh, experimental uh, indicator, there was uh, when you do the interpolation, you smooth it a little bit more. So this is why it's a lot le uh, lot less uh, spurious than the Lagrangian uh, framework. And also, uh, an interesting thing is that if you look closely uh, in the Lagrangian uh, framework, you have negative values, which you, you don't have in the Eulerian framework. And this is still something what, that we are trying to understand. If uh, those findings can be summed up by doing the joint PDE of both indicators, average over several uh, time instances, uh, and the joint uh, PDF tends to be aligned along the x equal y axis, which indicates that the two indicators are, uh, uh, are equal or tend to be equal. Uh, even from uh, our noisy uh, um, measurements, it, one still can um, see it. So we are quite happy with those results uh, as it is the first experimental proof uh, of the theorem, uh, even at the fixed resolution above uh, the Kolmogorov flame scale and at a fixed Reynolds number. So I think this will be 
it for my uh, for my talks or the conclusions are, 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 are twofold. First, we did an extensive study of temporal denoising algorithm for 4D PTV. Uh, we um, we made the first experimental proof of the Drivers theorem, which shows an equivalency between a Lorentz interscale uh, interscale energy transfer and Lagrangian reversibility. Oh, sorry, there are some uh, um, um, some errors. And now on to further works. Well, the idea is to increase the Reynolds, is to use also the uh, giant von Karman, which will have a four, uh, four times stronger, uh, small, uh, stronger uh, spatial resolution, will be able to go even further into the turbulence. And there's a lot of uh, still unanswered questions. Um, are, one of the main uh, questions that I have is how are the particle trajectories in those irre strong irre irreversible spots? What is going on in those events? Do we observe events below dissipative range, which tend to separate particles and which have a strong uh, irreversible uh, signature? So those are the kinds of questions that uh, um, I want to pursue. So I thank you for your time and I will finish by saying that it's, uh, this work will not have been possible without the, uh, the huge uh, uh, work of the whole exploit team, both in uh, uh, LMFL and uh, um, at CERA. So uh, I thank everybody. And I will end up with saying that we are waiting for you because uh, everything at CERA is ready uh, for GVK. So GVK is now in our uh, facility at CERA and we are looking forward to having you and to do some uh, um, measurements. So thank you again for your time. Thanks a lot, Adam. Uh, so I would say the stage is open for questions. If uh, there are, uh, if there is any question for Adam, please uh, open your mic and uh, you can ask it your, uh, yourself. And if you if you cannot communicate it by your mic, you can uh, write it in the chat. Or we will uh, we'll, uh, report the question. Please go ahead if you have any question. So there is actually a question in uh, in the chat. Uh, so um, uh, how the Lagrangian irreversibility indicator are related to the happen of exponents? It's a, a very good question and I will have a very short answer. Unfortunately, I don't know. Uh, I don't know much, too much about the Lyapunov exponents. I might, uh, I don't want to answer something wrong. So um, I have no idea. And it's something that I will certainly uh, have to look into it. Um, it's on my checklist, <laughs> on my to-do list. Uh, is there any other question for Adam? Uh, can I venture a comment or question? Uh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Uh, can, you, can you hear me, Alain? Yeah, very good. So, Christos talking. Nice to see you again. Hi, Christos. Um, you said that, I think correctly, that uh, backward uh, pair dispersion is stronger than forward pair dispersion. Yep. I think this is in three dimensions. In two-dimensional turbulence, uh, where you have a five-third spectrum by forcing up the small scales and therefore the energy, is, the, the cascade is going up the scales, yep. is the other way around. Backward yep. distribution is weaker than forward in two dimensions. Yeah, this is 3D. Yeah. Uh, so I think the, the reason why this backward and forward is different is because you actually basically uh, uh, experience as you evolve backwards or forwards in time, the cascade going forwards or backwards. And when this happens, you experience uh, eddies or vortices in some sense coming together or breaking up as you separate the two particles. Wouldn't then it be, wouldn't then be a much more relevant thing to do to study this reversibility by looking at the initial range rather than looking at the dissipative very small scales. Mm. Of course, uh, it. I think it would be very interesting to do it. Uh, and well, uh, and we have everything. Um, I mean, it's even easier to do it at the uh, inertial 
uh, range scale than uh, dissipative scale because uh, dissipative scales means that you have to have uh, two particles below Kolmogorov growth uh, length scale uh, and you are and you have to have to be able to track them uh, inertial scale uh, means that uh, it, it's, it's a lot easier because uh, 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 experimentally speaking so we have um, everything is uh, I mean available to do it uh, why are we interesting in, in, in small scales uh, is uh, is because uh, uh, of of the idea of what we, uh, I, I try to show here of spontaneous stochasticity is the question is uh, what happens if we have two particles which are extremely extremely close are they still able to uh, separate uh, and uh, we still haven't been able to um, 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 track experimentally events which separate those um, 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 those particles, and this is something that we are keen on 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 on, uh, on trying to have, and which we will be able to do uh, in Jivika. Uh, does it answer your question? Uh, yeah, partly. Uh, I take it that uh, looking at the actual range is easier and perhaps even more relevant. But thank you. Uh, uh, Christos, can I, can I comment on your, on your question? But just, uh, I mean, uh, for, I, I, I think they also kind of had a target for uh, proving the, the principle, like proving the, the theorem, which kind of requires yeah. that L to tend to zero. Yeah. That's it. So I think in that terms, they kind of need uh, L to, to, like they, can, they cannot stay in the, in the inertial range uh, for proving the theorem. Yeah, the, we, need, we need the uh, probe scale to turn to zero, exactly. So to, to, go, to go towards smaller scales. No, I agree about that. It wasn't about the theorem. I was looking, it was about the irreversibility. Yeah. And I was saying that that effect is mostly and perhaps most easily seen in the initial range. Yes. Yes, but, but you, are, you are true. And um, uh, to comment on what you are saying, the uh, Jusha et al. in 2014, they were looking at, uh, uh, they, they, they probed um, and they m made some measurements in the uh, uh, inertial range scale. And they proved it experimentally as well as uh, by hand uh, in the inertial, as long as you have particles in the inertial uh, range uh, um, uh, range scale. Thank you, Adam. Uh, is there any other question for for Adam? I think uh, uh, someone else opened the camera before. Maybe they wanted to ask a question. I think it was Young Gang. Ah, uh, might be. Uh, yeah, it's me. Adam, hello. Hi. Uh, I have a simple question uh, about your noise reduction method. Is yep. it possible to use it for like a PIV measurement or some other? Uh, so this is, uh, I will go straight to it. Uh, the thing is right now, this is for uh, uh, 1D, uh, uh, 1D signal. Um, yeah. It's extended. Um, so for the um, 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 you can change it and this function here does not have to be 1D, uh, it can be 3D and, uh, or 2D and, uh, it will, uh, and this is actually what is being used for the interpolation phase. Uh, if I go back upwards, um, um, bum, 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 I will try to show it to you here. Uh, if you, inter um, if you uh, try to, uh, to interpolate, uh, you can interpolate on a, a, a basis of functions, uh, a B-spline function, uh, which is a 3D B-spline function. And you will have mm -hmm. the same kinds of, of tools. Uh, and this is um, actually the, uh, so the second part here, which I've been working on, and there is a, uh, an algorithm uh, uh, which works uh, to be able to smooth spatially uh, um, and uh, also interpolate. Uh, and for and this is for 3D uh, PIV or and so and you can have several kinds of uh, regularizations uh, on the high frequencies, but also on, on the divergence. You can try to have, to to have uh, put a divergence which is as close as possible to zero 
uh, or, or not. Uh, you can have several kinds of uh, regularization. And uh, people, um, so this is done by DLR uh, in Germany, and they even are capable of um, uh, putting in the pressure and regularization, both pressure and uh, velocity, uh, and uh, by putting basically the Navier-Stokes equations into a regularization scheme. So of course, yes, mm -hmm. it's possible. Okay. Okay. Thanks. And we, I mean, it's it's possible, and uh, uh, we have it at LMFL. Oh. But I okay, did, okay. just did not uh, comment on it or speak about it. It's some sometime I will, but I don't have. Uh, I still don't have had the time to put uh, um, to do the article basically. Oh, okay. <laughs> I I get your point. Thank you. So is there any other question for, for Adam? Feel free to, to open your mic if you have one or to write it in the chat, we will report it. Um, well, if not, I, I, can, uh, I can ask a question my, myself. Um, so, uh, uh, before you, you showed the kind of a, I mean, you had a nice picture with the length scale uh, um, L with uh, particle trajectories and uh, yeah, that's the slide 22, I think. Uh, uh, no, uh, the number two? Uh, 22, 22. Ah, 22, sorry. Uh, yep, 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 yep. Uh, I, yeah, yeah. Yeah right, uh, and uh, and basically there you you say um, I mean you, you you take the limits of uh, uh, nu tending to to zero by taking the limits of uh, Reynolds tending to to infinity. Of course, that's uh, uh, I mean that's that's uh, uh, that's no. fine. Um, no. But I mean, uh, um, can you comment on the on the experimental? Uh, uh, limits which one has with that because I mean uh, I think we, we kind of touched uh, a little bit this this, this topic in a, in a few conversations we had before but I, I mean um, whenever your Reynolds goes to 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 infinity basically um, at a certain point you you will start uh, you you need to have a smaller smaller L right um, a smaller and smaller, sorry. M. Like the uh, regions, the, the region uh, which you need oh, yeah. to, to kind of uh, uh, identify or to kind of uh, reconstruct uh, uh, should, be, should get smaller and smaller. And uh, the relative difference between uh, uh, the, the, the ratio between the, the size of the particles you're going to consider and the size of the region you want to reconstruct uh, becomes uh, uh, itself larger and larger. So the importance of, uh, uh, of um, particles not being tracers becomes uh, uh, more and more uh, somehow uh, more and more important. So uh, is there a limit of the Reynolds number you, you can kind of envision uh, also based on the number on, on the diameter of the particle you manage, you, you manage to to, to, to track uh, such mm. that they don't interact with each other or their, such that their size does not distort too much the, the, the flow field around and the reconstruction is trustful. Uh, to answer, um, um, it's a very interesting question. Um, um, I think that the, uh, we, we will have some experimental limits which will be way, uh, which, which uh, will happen way before uh, what you are uh, speaking about. Uh, the thing is, uh, so in 4D PTV, we need a, a dense flow field. Um, um, and we need to be, we want to be able to resolve uh, the smaller scales. The thing is, if you increase the Reynolds number, the um, uh, kolmogorov lane scale will shrink. So that was the idea of GVK, to have a bigger experiment, to be, to be able to have bigger uh, uh, structures. Uh, but th the same thing will happen. So we'll just postpone uh, um, the, the limits. And at some point, um, um, the uh, obtainable 
um, particle density uh, will be such uh, that uh, um, um, the, di the difference between the uh, two particles will be a lot more than Kolmogorov will, which will shrink. So uh, we'll still have the same uh, difficulties, uh, but this is why uh, either by having a larger experiment or trying to have a, a better um, uh, tracking algorithm and with uh, finer details and, uh, um, and fancy stuff, uh, we, we should be able to increase in, keep increasing the particle density to be able to be to access those small scales. So it's both experimental and uh, um, um, uh, signal processing, um, which I think will help us keeping uh, going further further into uh, uh, into small scales. Uh, I I don't think that uh, we'll be able to see. Uh, um, um, the, uh, the, the the particle size itself as as uh, the, the real uh, limit. I mean, maybe, but in, in a long time, we still have a lot of work to do. Okay, okay, thanks. Uh, is there any other question for for Adam? I remind you that so you can open your mic or write on the chat if you want. Okay? Um, well, this does not seem to be to be the case. So, right. uh, thanks, Adam, uh, once again for for this very interesting presentation and uh, uh, for uh, opening 